I would say to you guys, I would any time, never, please don't just believe me. Don't just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. And of course, we'll be reading through the whole book, God willing, so that you know that I'm not making any of this up. The term Galatia is still used to this day. Galactas. Matter of fact, some people are not very tolerant to Galactas. <laughs> How's that to start with? So we'd say you're lactose intolerant. When you're lactose intolerant, what is the primary fluid that you, that you would not drink? No. Milk. We live in a particular place that we would call a galaxy. Same word. Galactas, galaxy. Do you know the name of our galaxy? The Milky Way. I think that that's kind of point to, point to be made. Now, the reason I say that is, why is this area called Galatia? <clears throat> it's called Galatia because of people who live there. Really, really strange. Now, when you think of somebody that's Turkish, what do they look like to you? Slightly tanned. Dan. Slightly tanned. <laughs> slightly tanned <laughs> Dan. Yeah. yeah, so they have that Mediterranean olive skin. Yeah. Are they big and chunky or thin? They're slim. Are they tall or short? Short. They are short. They're traditionally shorter, thin, Mediterranean guys, today with a lot of facial hair. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that when you think about it, Ephesus, that for Second Timothy or First Timothy, and Revelation, for instance, and Galatia and Colossians were all written to Turkey. That's all in Turkey. And you'll kind of go, man, where's the church in Turkey today? But in the middle of Turkey, in the area of Galatia, the people don't look like that at all. They actually look quite a bit like Lois. And dare we say, you've kind of got milky skin, girl. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when someone is from Galatia and they're like, I'm Turkish, you kind of go, <laughs> no, you're not. You know? And they're like, no, no, really, I am. And they, so they named the region after the people that they believed were, in essence, actually relocated from uh, France, from Gaul at the time, and from Switzerland. Uh, arguable. What's that? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So all of that said, it's important to recognize Paul doesn't write this to a church in Galatia like it's the city, but rather to the churches in a region called Galatia. <clears throat> now, in the book of Acts, where we get a little bit of background, we get introduced to the region of Galatia, by the way, uh, in... Acts 18, verse 23, when it says that he departed and went over to the region of Galatia. He's on, for what it's worth, a uh, second mission trip. Uh, it actually says before that, that Paul was actually, he had just scooped up a young guy named Timothy. Assumedly, got, uh, by the way, assumedly in his team. <coughs> now, Timothy comes from the area, that Lacaonia area of Lystra and Derby. Now, <coughs> why is that important? Because the last time Paul was there, he was stoned to death or stoned nearly to death. But he goes there, he preaches Jesus, they stone him, drag him out of the city, and it says the disciples stand around him and pray, and Paul gets up. Now, are those brand new believers? Could very well, could they be the people from Laconia? They're the most likely candidates for that. But imagine being brand new Christians, and the first thing you see is, hey, dude, this guy's teaching us, and uh, he just got stoned to death, we should pray. The guy get him up, and we pray, and he does. It's amazing when you start your walk with Christ, how you have that kind of faith. And it is so sad how as we get older, how, what in the world happened to us that we stop trusting God to do what he wants to do? Well, and Paul does the strangest thing. He goes back in the city where they stoned him to go get Barnabas, and they leave. The second time through that area is when he scoops up Timothy. So imagine the last time that guy was through Greenwich, he got beat up and left for dead, but he got back up and went out, and, I go, and you think, Dude, if that guy's back in here, I'm going to join that ministry. Well, that was the issue with Timothy. And what happens is they go then from, the, when he picks up Timothy there, he heads through that Galatian region, and this is what it says, that when he had gone through Phrygia and the region, not just the city, but the region of Galatia, this is Acts 16.6, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, some of you are familiar with the story. He tries to go due north. That would be today Istanbul. The Holy Spirit stops him. He tries to go due west, which would be Ephesus. Again, he stopped by the Holy Spirit. So instead of going due north or due west, he goes northwest and winds up in Troas, where he gets the vision of the Macedonian man, winds up going to Europe. Thank you for that, by the way, because therefore the gospel went to Europe, and that's how we're sitting around this table today. Now, what happened to him? How did the Holy Spirit stop him? We don't have record here. But I do have this hint. Listen to this, and this comes from the book of Galatians. 
This is what he says in chapter 4, verse 13. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, or even as Christ Jesus. What was the blessing that you enjoyed? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have even plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. I kind of get the idea it had something to do with his eyes, or you just wanted to pluck out your eyes because he was so awful to look at. I'm going with that he was something in his eyes. Paul was sick. And when he arrived in Galatia, he was sick. That's what he tells us in this book. Now, is that what the Holy Spirit used to stop him from going up into Istanbul? Maybe, maybe not. One thing's clear, though. He was a mess. Matter of fact, at the end of this letter we're going to read, he'll say, see what large letters I write to you. In other words, his eyes are still bad. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call someone to the carpet just to see here. Doctor? Doctor? In the Mediterranean culture, can you think of anything that would be sort of a pathogen disease that would really affect your eyesight? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there are two that are traditional in the area of, of Galatia, and I just thought, if nothing else, your accountability to it. One is cholera, <clears throat> but the other is malaria, which radically affects your eyesight. There's two different kinds of malaria, but one of them is cerebral. gets in your head. You know, like, hey, Carlo, come on in, bro. Yeah. I think we have one more here. These. Yeah. Um, so one way or another, he was in, but what if he did have malaria? I mean, he would be a mess, but he shows up there, and as he shows up there, he doesn't get to, I mean, basically, it was a pit stop, and, and it was a place where he couldn't get to where he wanted to get next. It tells us in his, sec, his third missionary journey that he spent some time there, and he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order to strengthen the disciples. So he did plant a church there, and then he went back and visited on his next trip around. The issue really isn't the, the Galatia that he's writing to just because... Hey, you guys, what's it like? How are the mosquitoes? Paul is a specific group of opponents in Galatia that he has to go at, and he is going for their throat. This is one of the letters where you'll find some of the harshest language ever. I mean, I'll be honest, he speaks of castration here. He speaks of, um, of people going to hell if they're going to do this, if they're going to go about this way. May they, may they burn in hell. That's, that's about as, that is strong, that's as strong a language as you're going to get, which means... As where in 2 Corinthians, Paul may have been really, really hurt. Galatians, he's just angry. He is angry and he's coming at it. And he's coming at you. And I find it interesting, though the Galatian church, do you remember, by the way, I'm sorry, the Corinthian church, do you remember the three major problems in 1 Corinthians that he mentions about the church? Yeah. There were divisions. Suing each other. Yeah, they were suing each other. And, and there was sexual tolerance about a guy sleeping with his mom. He never questions their salvation. He actually says, you know, you guys are carnal. You are clearly carnal. The most charismatic church listed in scripture is not that they have to be the case, but it was the most carnal. And they were competing over the very things. He says, you lack no spiritual gift, but you guys are still, and it's amazing to think you could actually be spirit-filled, but totally flesh-led. Now, in all of that, <clears throat> in this particular place, he goes back, he strengthens the church, but there are a group of people Paul has to deal with. So let me give you a little bit of background, and then we'll actually, I don't have much to give here, but I want to, because I want to be able to let the, the, the word do the teaching here. But I need to at least kind of get you into this. In the book of Acts, Jesus actually tells his disciples when they think, he's about to ascend, and they think, are you setting up your kingdom now? And it's amazing, we can get into kingdom theology, and sometimes it can get really funky. And sometimes it can become really awesome. It all depends on what it is we focus on. But understand, <coughs> Jesus says, that's not for you to know. You need to know this. You will receive power, dunamis, the ability to overcome. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You all with me on that? Mm -hmm. That's really the structure of the whole book of Acts. And it's like, what you find then is, well, first thing is Jerusalem, and that becomes Act chapter, Acts chapters 1 and 2. And of course, it starts to spread throughout all Judea from chapters 3 through 6 and 7. 
Uh, and then, of course, it starts to spread through Samaria at the beginning of eight and then to the ends of the earth through, through um, <clears throat> the end of it when we have the Ethiopian eunuch, for instance, the, the treasurer for Queen Candace. Clearly, that's an end of the earth for a place like Jerusalem. Now, key to note that, by the way, that means that there is a guy bringing the gospel in Acts chapter 8 to Africa. Love that. Y'all with me so far? <laughs> now, here's the point. Up to this point, though, other than I would have to say the Ethiopian eunuch, because you can, and don't argue with the Ethiopians over that, because there are those who are convinced they're Jewish. I don't know. It's not for me to know. I know this, though, that when Peter winds up at the house of a Roman centurion, his name is Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. That's when things really hit the fan. Now, please hear me in this. Peter is actually in Joppa, which today is called Joppa, or Jaffa, like Jaffa oranges, just south of Tel Aviv. And he gets a vision to go, and ultimately he actually does interpret it well. God speaks to him through food. That tells you something. And ultimately he winds up going to this place, doubting nothing, and he goes, and he takes with him six Jewish guys. In other words, he's not going to do this without getting at least a few guys with him. And it's important to note that he goes there, and as he goes there, it is Cornelius. By the way, it's important to note, by the way, if you're a Bible student, I challenge you to find one place in Scripture that a centurion spoken of poorly. The, the Romans didn't just elevate a guy because he was a great killer. He had to be a man of moral standard and of ethical base because they didn't want that kind of guy in a place with a weapon that could walk in your room at night while you're sleeping. You needed to be, he needed to be a guy you could trust. Every centurion in Scripture is listed as a noble man. Like the guy that was at the cross saying certainly this was a just man about Jesus. Or the one that tries to set Paul free in the book of Acts at the end. I mean, these guys are actually decent guys. Or the one that helped build the synagogue in Capernaum. They're actually decent guys. Now, still Romans, so you have to deal with that. But when he goes there, he still has this prejudice. Because up to this point, and hear me on this, up to Acts chapter 10, Christianity was a Jewish thing. Oddly enough, soon after that, they would tell you you can't be both. But he goes, and the traditional response is you walk into a person's house, you become a part of their family. So you are very careful who you let in your house. It's one of the reasons John will say in 2nd and 3rd John, hey, don't let in false teachers in your house. You're endorsing them by doing that. No. But when he walks in, it isn't like this, just like Cornelius is there. Cornelius has invited his friends and his family and he's a centurion, so he's over a hundred soldiers. And chances are he's brought them all in. So imagine, if you will, you kind of go in this place. I remind you, the Romans in the side of the disciples had killed Jesus. And now you're going into the lair. I mean, you're going in and you open, you know, the guy opens the door and there are hundreds or, you know, or however many soldiers. <laughs> you're thinking, I'm going to walk into this. But he does. Now let me ask you. If the Lord spoke to you and said, I'm going to bring somebody who has the message you need to hear, and I'm going to send him to your house, who do you invite over? Would you invite your family? Would you invite the people you work with? Would you be afraid that that would just embarrass you and you? I think it's a great lesson from Cornelius, a great step of faith. And Peter starts to preach the gospel. And as he does... The Holy Spirit jumps these guys. Interesting, he doesn't even do the altar call. They clearly believe, and they start to manifest the same gift that he's only seen once before, according to Scripture, and that was in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. And it is imperative that it happened that way. So Peter comes back to Jerusalem, and you would imagine a little confused, but buzzing. Hundreds of people just gave their life to Christ. How would you feel? Imagine, go, imagine going back to church and telling him that. Hey, there's a lot of really cool things God can do, but there's one thing that stokes God more than anything else. And let, let me just say, giving you, the, give me, giving you the shakes and the so forth, that's cool. Healing people is still is, is awesome, but the one thing that blesses God more than anything else is people getting saved and people being used to do it. Remember when his disciples were casting out demons and they came back thinking they all bad? <laughs> and, and Jesus says, glory not that demons are subject to you. In other words, that should not be the thing that jazzes your groovy. 
goes, but let me tell you what should, that your name is written in, the, in, in heaven. And he goes, you know the one thing that should stoke you more than anything is that you're saved. And nothing else should compare. But that's rough, man. Because, you know, it's like getting engaged. That ring looks good for a while, but sooner or later the wedding better start happening or people start wondering what's wrong with you. But when Peter gets back to church, to, to Jerusalem, he gets the what for, man? People start pulling him aside and yelling at him. Imagine that. You went, I'm gonna, I mean, forgive me for being a little curt here, but it's like you went to where there was a group of pedophiles. Or you went to prison to a group of people that were child abusers or rapists, but they all got saved. You went into ISIS, preached the gospel, and they all gave their life to Christ. Can you think of anything that you'd show back up at church and people would yell at you for doing it? If so, man, something needs to change. Because what's clear is it's messed up. Does that make sense so far? And we read about a group of people now called the circumcision. And they're yelling at Peter and said, you went into uncircumcised house and ate with them? You went to those Gentiles, those non-Jewish people? What's wrong with you, man? And I love the fact that what Peter does is he doesn't defend himself. He just gives testimony. He goes, let me tell you what happened, man. You decide for yourself. I was sleeping up on a roof, praying, I mean, and has vision. God had this vision. It was kind of a bug and beast buffet, kill and eat. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, I was obedient, and I heard it, and I got it, and then I followed, and I went, because God told me to. And then I went there. What if there at Cornelius' house, they all prophesied but didn't speak in tongues? Or they levitated or just glowed in the dark? It wouldn't have mattered because the Jewish people in Jerusalem would have said, well, they've got that gift, but we've got ours. But the fact that he gave them the same gift, Peter's able to testify. And he goes, hey, if God gave them the same gift he gave us, then exactly what's the problem here? Does that make sense? So who in the world are these circumcision people? Because they become, this becomes their gang sign, if you will. Well, actually, you don't even want to think of what a gang sign would look like for that. But the whole point of it is, is that this is the group, this is what they're calling themselves now, the circumcision. It tells us this, by the way. So in chapter 11, the whole, Paul has two major showdowns. And this will come really important when we read the book. In chapter 11, the showdown there, by the way, is over whether, get this, whether people who aren't Jewish could even be saved at all. See, there was a guy named Shemai. He was one of, they called those sages. There was Shemai and Halal. And Shemai taught that anybody who wasn't Jewish was basically, sincerely, fuel for hell. God created them just to fuel hell, as if God needed to throw people in to keep the fire going. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to me. So if you were raised with that mindset, if you were raised with that mindset, and then God started saving people that were Gentiles. Well, let me say it this way. We're all raised with lies. We have truth, and we're all raised with some sort of lies in us. Most of us, me included, we don't know what the lies are. Because if it's taught as truth, it's just true. Somewhere in this, especially if you're going to be in God's word, you're going to get into head-on collisions with the truth. It's what you're thinking, and this is what the Bible says, and it's going to go like this, and one of them is going to have to give. The only option is either you're going to actually try to remove the truth to try to keep your idea, or you're going to have to give way. I love that, by the way, because it takes humility to go, you know, I always kind of thought that, then I read this verse, and I'm like, no, that says the opposite. It's a pretty profound thing. Does that make sense? That's part, of what it, that's part of what's cool about being a Christian is I'm not running the universe, so I don't have to know everything. And I'm just learning like you guys are. But when I look, come across them, I'm like, whoa, that's what it says. And you're like, well, can you explain everything? I don't have to. That's where faith steps in. Isn't that the beauty of faith? It's like, I believe that because God tells me I don't have to explain it. I'm not the one who's doing it. But I also can't explain all of the laws of aerodynamics but I'll still get in a plane because I know it gets me where I need to go. And so in chapter 11, the showdown is, could you, let me ask, are any of you here 100% Jewish? Kind of go, guess and no. What that means is chapter 11's debate was over us. 
whether we could even ever be saved. Aren't you glad they decided, well, if they gave them the same gift, I guess they could all be saved. Right? Anyone need anything? Is it cold? You, it's, it's, you look cold. I'm fine. I'll turn it off. Thanks, Alex. You're awesome. Yeah. Oh, you cold? Was you cold? We just slapping the beat. Yeah. That's awesome. Whoa. Yeah. Does that make sense so far, though? Yeah. <coughs> There's going to be another debate in chapter 15. And here's the deal. It tells us this. In chapter 15, the issue is, well, if you guys, us guys, could be saved, do we maybe we could just try to make them Jewish so that for I don't have to change my doctrine? Does that make sense? I mean, technically, if Tunde gets circumcised and he becomes a you know, Jewish Christian, well, then God still just saves Jewish people. Right? Does Tunde need to be circumcised and keep all the laws of Moses, 623 laws that we see in the Old Testament? So that's chapter 15's argument. First one is, could you even be saved at all? The second is, well, now that you are, what do you have to do? Does that make sense? But it tells us this in Acts chapter 15, verse 5, who the circumcision were. Listen to this. It was the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Now, please hear me in this, because now I'm almost done, so we can get to just reading straight through the text. Every one of you has an Excel button, or maybe a couple. There are things that get you to the front of the queue, the things that put the spotlight on you, things that make you a little bit on top of the, of the pile. That may be social, that may be your humor, that may be your intellect, that may be your ability to, to work with computers, and that may be the way that you can system think, it may be a talent, or the way you look. But it's something that made you, it's probably the one thing that probably made you feel relatively good about yourself before you were saved. And we have this terrible habit of saying, I surrender all at the cross, but still trying to drag things over. See, if Jesus can't resurrect or won't resurrect it, it needs to stay buried. And so what happens is people are like, well, I'd come to Christ, but he needs to let me be. Then you're not coming to Christ. And I love this argument. Well, Jesus needs to receive me for who I am. But if you demand Jesus to do that, you're not receiving Jesus for who he is. Say, look, at, he needs to be the architect of your reinvention from the ground up. And if he doesn't, then you're going to drag something over too, and you're going to fight for it. And you know what you'll be? You'll be a dash Christian. And what I mean by that is, you'll be a, whatever the word is, something Christian. But whatever that thing is, it's going to fight because it's something that you get your identity from. And I'm a black Christian. I'm a white Christian. I'm a London Christian. I'm a Messianic Christian. I'm a whatever Christian. But somewhere in it, it's like there's Jesus, but there's also this other thing that defines me. And here's the problem is, if, is that whatever that other thing is, is going to exclude other brothers and sisters. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I can tell you, I played bass for a lot of black gospel churches. And they, I'd walk in and people would be go, there goes the neighborhood. Like, you're going to be able to play. Hmm. And I'm like, so you're only saying that because I'm white, right? And I know what happens the other way around. Th that's the problem. It shouldn't be white church and it shouldn't be black church. And it shouldn't be young church and it shouldn't be old church. It shouldn't be this is the tattoo church. Or it shouldn't be this is the one where we get piercings. Or this is the one where we're all going to just do hymns and wear three-piece suits. Hey, there are going to be places we kind of find ourselves, but in the end of it all, if we're not, if we're not careful, it'll be, we'll become a hyphen Christian. And that's what these people were. They were Pharisee Christians. But there are some things that just don't play out more than others. It's like being a Christian stripper. It just doesn't work. <laughs> I waited till you drank some. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the problem. Who was the most fiery, passionate, 
outspoken, contentious Pharisee there was that we could tell. Saul of Tarsus. So when that guy got saved, you'd have thought you would have had the best, you'd have had your spokesperson for the circumcision, except he didn't, believe, he didn't buy into it. When Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain, he meant it. And let me just say this, you will never honestly be able to say the second if you can't say the first. You'll never honestly be able to say to die is gain if you can't live as Christ. And Paul meant it. So listen to this. When Paul writes to the Romans, he says in 2.28, He's not a Jew if he's one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is made outward in the flesh. He's fighting the, the circumcision group in Rome. In 1 Corinthians, he says it this way. Circumcision isn't the point. It's keeping the commandments of God that matters. That's 1 Corinthians 7.19. He had a problem with that group in Corinth. In Ephesians 2.11, remember, therefore, you once, Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, clearly had a problem with that in Ephesus. In Philippi, we are, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. He had to deal with these, these bozos in Philippi. In Colossians, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by the putting on of the body of the sin of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. He dealt with that in Colossae, though he had never been to Colossae or Rome yet. He was still dealing with them. In other words, Romans, Corinth, Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, all had, to, all had these guys running around saying, well, now that you're saved, this is what you're going to have to do. It's called legalism. And no matter how it plays out, legalism in its simplest sense is your set of convictions become universal to everyone and say, you're not, a, you're not even saved unless you do it this way. And there will be people like, if your hair is this long, or if you listen to praise choruses, or you worship on a Sunday. That's one of my favorites. That's the mark of the beast. What? But there are people that purport that. And it's like, unless you're baptized into our church, unless you sit under this particular thing or whatever, and it gets so nuts. And I'm like, you know what's funny is, it was so simple when it was just accepting <coughs> Jesus' gift. Yeah and you're saved, and now all of a sudden I feel like there's all this bureaucracy involved. Listen, the moment it gets complicated, it stops being about God. God makes it simple because he wants the simplest person to say yes. Actually, Tuesday afternoon proved that again when we had a young man come in who clearly was, was dealing with his own things, but um, and within 10 minutes he was giving his life to Jesus Christ. It was beautiful, simple, transforming awesome but we make complicated what God makes simple and what I love is having fellowship with people that are actually going isn't it just amazing to be saved isn't it great that it's about Jesus because you know what it doesn't matter whether you're charismatic or whether you're liturgical or whether you come from a full gospel church or <laughs> perfectly every church is full gospel you know, it's like, or whatever, it's like whether you go to an Anglican church or whether you go to a Caribbean church, in the end of it all, isn't it just amazing that we all should go to hell and he didn't let us? Because everything else is really at best chips, but it ain't the main course. This is what Paul says to Titus as he's about to die. And he writes to Timothy and Titus on his first arrest and then second Timothy and his other. He says this, for there are those there are, they are made subordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who submert, subvert whole households, teaching things they ought not to for the sake of dishonest gain. Clearly, Paul says to Titus, dude, you need to know that group, that group is just driving me crazy. Because it's, and hear me, it's, it stops being about Jesus. So let me say one more thing and I'll give the basic overview and we're just going to read. Every, consider this, there are only two religions in the world. There is the religion where you do all the work and at the end, hopefully it's good enough. Somebody judges, something judges, the universe, some person, whatever. We put it all in there, but you are the one, it's all about you, man. You are the impetus, you are the worker. And you keep doing it and you keep doing it and hopefully it's enough. <coughs> It doesn't matter what religion you listen, you, you read. Other than that of Jesus Christ, that's where you're going to go. It's all about good works. 
But the gospel of Jesus Christ says, when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, when we were enemies of our, in our hearts to God, Christ still died for us. In other words, he did all the work and we do the choose. We make the choice. Now, so what happens when we realize that the first is called works and the second is called grace? And we realize we receive Jesus and Jesus doesn't love you because you're so dang lovable. He loves you because he is love and he isn't change. So he won't change his mind. <clears throat> what happens when we take that and we start making it the other? We can all do that. Because all it is is starting to think, I do it and God responds. I pray enough, I fast enough, I sing enough, I go to church enough, and God is obliged now to respond in some favorable manner. Versus responding. Responding to his love and worshiping him. Fasting because you know you're not f close to God like you should, but you know it's not him, it's you. It's amazing what happens when it's the real deal. And you realize this is the only place where Paul doesn't give this great, I just can't stop praising God when I think about you. This is the one place where he actually says he has doubts. So let me kind of go in this basic sense and then prove me wrong, but, but consider this. Chapters 1 and 2, Paul will give his testimony. And the simplest point is salvation cannot be a work of man. It has to be done by grace. Chapters 3 and 4, sanctification cannot be a work of man. It has to be a work of God by grace. Chapters 5 and 6, service cannot be a work of man. It has to be, uh, it has to be by God by grace. Does that, do those th three things sound familiar? What book focused on things like salvation, sanctification, and service? Romans. Romans. Five S's, right? Can yeah. you tell me what they are? First was? Sin. sin. Where sin, everyone sins. Therefore, the problem's universal. What was the second S? Salvation. 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 Right? We are saved by grace through faith. What's the third one then? Sanctification. Sanctification. God, once you've said yes to him, he sets you apart. What's the fourth? Sovereign. Sovereign. God is sovereign and? He's small. And he's smart. So <coughs> trust in that. And then finally, the last one? Service. Service. Okay. That's the whole point. So what Paul is doing is he's walking us through the same thing, but saying... And watch how he, re how he addresses this, because what he's going to say is, man, this isn't for man. This isn't for man. I didn't get saved through man. And this isn't through man. Salvation can't be. And being set apart, that can't be through man. That is through God who does that. And when God raises you up to serve, and he'll say here, by the way, he says, you've been set free, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for vice, but through love serve one another. Okay, does that make sense? So now we're going to read around six chapters. Buckle in. And then we're going to praise God. <clears throat> Paul, and I'll make a couple statements here and there, but try not to make many. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatea. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever and ever. <clears throat> I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel, from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached we preach to you, let him be accursed. What does that mean? Let him be accursed. Let him go to hell. How's that in a way, mate? Even if an angel did it? You're probably aware that there's a whole organization out there that says that basically they got their whole doctrine from an angel. And they even give him his Mormons. name. They're Mormons because they, that's named after the, the angel. The whole thing is from that. Let me ask you one quick thing on this and we'll move on. It says you're turning away to another gospel that's no gospel at all. What are you turning away from? Because it's actually deeper and more profound than that. Look at what it says in verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from, from him. You're not just trading one gospel for another that actually isn't a gospel at all. You're trading Jesus 
for this new gospel thing, which is just works in hopes that God's responds. <coughs> because you know what you're leaving? You're leaving Jesus for this. That's how huge it is. Okay. Verse 9. Because we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you than what you have received, let him be a first. But do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? But if I still please men, I will not be a bond servant of Christ. Then I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. I'm profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, <coughs> who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach to among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now hold on a second. You do know that that doesn't appear in the book of Acts, right? It's one very distinct moment we don't have in the book of Acts. So which one's true? They both are. The book of Acts is the book of Acts. What Paul tells us is Paul got saved on the way to Damascus, personally encountering Jesus. No other guy was involved. And then when he got to Damascus, he went to Arabia. And then he came back to Damascus. So when we read in the book of Acts, Paul was in Damascus, and then Paul started preaching the gospel in Damascus. Mm. In between those two times, Paul went to Arabia. What in the world did he do in Arabia? Let me challenge you with this. What Paul did in Arabia is what the circumcision had never done, and that's the problem. Somewhere down the line, he had been absolutely convinced this Jesus thing was a fraud. Fair enough. And he was going to make a living stomping out this cult, in his opinion, until he met the real Jesus. Once he met the real Jesus, he had a head-on collision with the truth. And when he had a head-on collision with the truth, he had to do this. Jesus, if you're real, how does that affect? We use a term, Arabia time. I'd like to challenge you to adopt it if you'd consider I know Bruno's heard it a few times, now Dan as well. The idea is simple. Jesus, if you're real and you're to be the Lord of my life, how does that affect the way that I view dating? Jesus, if you're real and I'm going to be the Lord of my life, how does that affect the way I view success? Jesus, if you're real and I'm going to be the Lord of my life, how does that affect my dreams and my goals in life? I realize the reason why so much of our Christianity could be so thwarted because we haven't had enough Arabia time. So a guy gets saved and then he starts getting involved with a girl, but he does it in a way that's clearly ungodly. I'm like, dude, you need to get away and get Arabia time on what it means to be a godly boyfriend. I love the fact that Paul gives us that example. Here, does that sound fair enough? Okay, we'll go on from there. Then after three years... I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia. And I was unknown by face to the church of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing, <coughs> but they were hearing only. He informed me, persecuted us, now preaches of faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. Now this would be that second showdown. Remember the one about, well, if Gentiles can be saved, do we have to make them Jews? And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles but privately to them which were which were of reputation least by any means I should run or had run in vain 
yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we did not yield submission, even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man, for those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also for me, for man, to the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that had been given to me, they gave me Barnabas, the right hand, the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, but the very poor which I was also eager to do. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was so, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, bearing those who were of the circumcision. It's like primary school <laughs> stuff. Like it's in the lunchroom, and now you go into the cool kids' table. Mm-hmm. Are you guys getting what's going on here so far? Mm-hmm. Paul went and he, and he dealt with this. He brought a Gentile with him to Jerusalem to deal with this question about what Jews have to, or what Gentiles have to do once they're saved. And he's like. I'm not convinced I need to be circumcised. With all due respect, I think you'd have to have a really good argument once you're a grown man to actually do something like that. But then he goes, now, Peter showed up in Antioch, Antioch, and this is, by the way, unique information that we only get here. And Peter's being a jerk because what he is is he's caving, he's caving in to peer pressure about this by the, by the um, circumcision. So... And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them, All, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why compassed thou the Gentiles to live as, as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed it in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. <clears throat> For I through the Lord died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive a spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing of faith? Are you One stop, did you get that? Remember the whole idea is if I do it, he'll respond versus he does it and I respond. Is that how you got the Spirit? Did you actually have to do something to get God's Holy Spirit? Did you have to prove it to God you were worthy of his Spirit? Did you have to earn his Spirit? Because isn't that what happens when we work and God responds, we earn it. Because this is all grace. You know what? God gave you his Holy Spirit because he's awesome. Because he's a God of grace and because he loves you. You'll never earn it. That's the beauty. And because you'll never earn it, you can't unearn it. How's that? Remember, grace is never dependent on the deservedness of the recipient, 
only on the kindness of the giver. And God never changes. So. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Remember, perfect means to finish its root. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? He therefore that ministers to you in the spirit and work of miracles among you, doeth he it by work or of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Genesis fifteen six. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Five different times first is in Genesis 12, 3. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. <coughs> For as many as are of the works of the law, sorry, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Deuteronomy 27, 26. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteousness shall live by faith. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, for the righteousness shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4. Remember how that's mentioned three different times in Scripture? In the New Testament, the first, developing the righteous or the just, that's Romans. The second, shall live, that's right here, by the Spirit versus by the law. And the last, by faith, and that will be in Hebrews chapter 10, right before Hebrews 11. Leviticus 18, 5. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Deuteronomy 21 22. Now I just completely lost the place. 14. <laughs> no worries, bro. Yeah. I'll be right honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 14, is it? Um, yeah. Uh, it's like, I don't know. Um, and, uh, I'm a, wait. <laughs> but the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of spiritual faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as to many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law of which the 430 years after cannot disarm that it should make to profit the promised of none effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here's the question then, which came first, the promise or the law? Promise. The promise. By how many years? 430. By 430 years. Now, I'd like you to consider this. Did God pull Israel out of Egypt and then give them the law? Or did he give him the law and said, if you do it, I'll get you out of Egypt? He pulled them out and gave them the law. So he's always been grace first. Yeah. So what is the promise to Abraham? <clears throat> that to you and to your seed, all the world will be blessed. And that's grace what isn't new. I felt like grace, is, grace has always been... God even said to Israel, I have not set my love upon you because you were great or mighty or you were so dang cute. Oh, I'm using those paraphrasing. He goes, but because I've so chosen to set my love upon you, because I've chosen to set my love upon you. It's by grace. It's always been by grace. And God's like, look at the whole world is going to be blessed through one person through you, Abraham. Trust me in this. And that person's Christ. It's always going to be a gift from God. When God called Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham, this is what we know. He lived in an idol-worshipping house. Joshua teaches us that in, in the end of Joshua, Joshua 24. Mm -hmm. Abraham, we don't read, was doing anything 
to merit, we don't read he was a great and noble man of faith or he was a mighty man of merit. God called Abraham out out of grace and Abraham went by faith. But the call came first. It wasn't like God looked and then God says, all right, Abraham, look up to the sky. See all those stars? Can you count them all? Clearly, this was someplace other than London, because he'd be saying, what star? He's like, well, that one's moving. <laughs> That's a plane, Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> but we call it in Israel the Thousand Star Hotel. What that means is you're sleeping outside. And you look up, and you see, and he's like, can you count them all? And you can see him saying, nope. <clears throat> And here's a guy that's past, he's, you know, at this point, he should be in a nursing home. And he goes, if you can count the stars, you can count your kids. My oldest, one of my greatest memories was Shante. She was probably three in my arm. And we, because we read straight through scripture, we read that text. And we, I'm like, you ready? And here she was in her PJs and the whole bit. And we were living by the, by the beach, and I just grabbed her. I said, let's go out. So we went out and said, see how many stars you can count. To this day, I don't even know if she can put them together. She says, I have to be someplace where I can see the stars. Because of that story. You know what it says? God said to Abraham, if you can count them, then you'll be able to count how many kids you have. And it says, Abraham believed them. And God called that being right with him. That's what righteousness is, is being right with someone. Abraham believed God. And God says, no, that's what it means to be right with me. How cool is that? So that's the whole point. Verse 19. Or is it me? What Who's purpose okay. does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of the mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confirmed all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until coming faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under our tutor. Pedagogos, the Greek word, you're still using today. Private tutor that actually helps raise you up until you can actually take the father's business. He says the law, the law is basically to lead you to that place. In other words, if you read the law, what it teaches you is, I need a savior. And then it leads you to Jesus, and Jesus goes, hey, I'm that savior. You're like, thank you, law. <laughs> Jesus is like, I'll take it from here. I've got, I've got a little thing about this here yeah, because, you know, with the Bible, especially in the New Testament, I feel like people are more privy to the works of Jesus in opposed to us where, to me, like, definitely a believer, definitely know that it exists, but sometimes I need more convincing, mm -hmm. you know, just as a person that can sometimes indulge in worldly things and you know it's not easy like you understand sure. and on top of that you know it just puts you in this thing where you know you know what's right you know what you want to do you know what you have to do but you just don't have that kind of motivation mm. that sure. you know that just ticks you forward in that direction so I was, I was just asking in that sense sure well here's the cool thing there's the difference between salvation you know like you said, you're a believer. You know that you're guilty from what you've done. You also know Jesus forgives you and cleanses you of that. But then there's also this issue of, but I'm still struggling with my desires. It's exactly what Paul said 25 years into his ministry when he said, why do I do what I don't want to do? And what I want to do, I don't do that at all. Feel him? Yeah. So, and that was, and this is, I mean, we're talking Paul, the guy who's writing this. We're not talking about some guy that's like, you know, some like yokel somewhere that's like, well, he was some, sort of saved, you know. I mean, it was like, this was a guy that was writing scripture. 
But he still dealt with it. He's like, you know, in the end of it all, God, you still have, we have still have more work to do. And it's like, but remember how Thomas, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, Thomas wasn't there for one moment. I, mean, I don't know how many moments he wasn't, but the one moment he wasn't there was the moment Jesus showed up. I always say, be careful when you miss church. And, you know, and it's like, and Jesus showed up, and then Thomas is like, you guys are all boneheads. What's wrong with you? A loose paraphrase. But, you know, in it, he's like, he goes, unless I can stick my finger in the prints of his nails, I'm not going to believe. The reason I say that is that in, Tim, in, uh, in Thomas's case, he was being for real. Now, he was a guy like you that would say, sometimes I need a bit more. Here's the great news. God knows what you need, and he knows what buttons to push. <clears throat> now, he could have just shown up to Timothy, or to Titus, I'm sorry, and just slapped him around and said, what's wrong with you, Thomas? Haven't I told you this already? But he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he goes, have at it, boy. Touch and feel. And I love the fact he doesn't even rebuke him for that necessarily at the moment, but he will rebuke them for their hardness of heart. And it's like when Nathaniel's brought Philip uh, brings Nathaniel to Jesus and he says, I saw you under the fig tree and the guy falls to his knees and goes, oh, you are, the, you are clearly the king of Israel. You know, like what in the world was he doing under a fig tree? Nobody knows but him. But what Jesus knew is that was the button he needed to push for him to believe. So I don't know what your buttons are, but I don't have to know your buttons. But Jesus does. But I warn you, tonight when you go to bed, he's going to be pushing one. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. I'm more confident in it than you are. But, to, but next time, we'll agree together. <laughs> well, okay. So, by the way, thank you for that. Yeah, sorry, um, sorry, I didn't don't, to don't be sorry. I love your honesty. Verse 26, who has it? Yeah, me. Okay. Um, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hold yeah, still in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither ma slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Stop. I have to say something here, don't I? Yeah. Please understand that there are two planes we're dealing with. A vertical and a horizontal. Let me say it this way. <coughs> if Tunde decides that he wants to go out for a walk, but he grabs his favorite machete with him. And as he goes, he jumps on the northern line sometime about 4.30, 5 o'clock at night, and then just starts practicing his ninja moves until basically everybody on the train's turned into a bit of a salad. Sounds like me. Right. He has murdered everyone in the train car. He turns to Jesus. Will he be forgiven if he confesses it, repents, and hands it over to the, to the Lord? Yes. yes. Jesus will forgive him. I'm not telling you to go do it, because here's the problem. That's the vertical, but the horizontal, he's still going to do time. He's still going to have to pay for his crimes here on earth. Does that make sense? Those are two very different worlds. When God looks down, he's not seeing you as slave or free, or as a male or female. He sees you as his. But in the world, you're still going to be a boy or a girl. You're still going to be employed or not employed. You're still going to be guilty or not guilty. Those are very different worlds. The problem is when you try to say, well, that's how God sees me. So, so therefore, that's just the way it should be here. Well, that doesn't exactly work that way. God has a very set order on earth. He calls some to be pastors. He calls some to be evangelists. He calls some to be prophets. He calls some to be teachers. And you say, well, we're all the same, bro. No, God actually has specific places for each person so that the world could be affected properly because he's a God of order. But universally, when God looks down on you, we're all saved. What he sees is his son. He sees Jesus because we're clothed in Christ. Does that make sense? But it's amazing how people take this verse and go, well... How dare guys have these roles or women have these roles and so forth? It's like, hey, there's a difference of a role in a church versus the way God sees you. Because he has places for everyone because he's a great coach and he knows where you're going to score the most points. All right, we'll move on, but I figured I had to throw that out there. And if ye be Christ's 
then ye are Abraham's seed and hers according to the promise. <coughs> now, I say, now I say that the heir, heir as, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To, rede to redeem those who are <coughs> under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You do see that God sees you all as sons. You think, well, is that chauvinist? <laughs> no. Remember, in the Middle East, a daughter is a temporary member of your family. She's going to marry and be a part of someone else. She'll have their surname. She's going to carry on their family name. When God looks and sees Lois, he doesn't see Lois as a daughter. He sees Lois as a son because she is a permanent member of the family. He's not marrying her off to anyone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's a grace in that. But here on earth, you girls. <laughs> not you, not you, bro. Not you, but the two of them. You're surrounded by girls. <laughs> but then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. <coughs> See, I look up and I listen. Every time. Yeah, man. First time. Jesus, gracious. Yeah. Jesus, um, <laughs> first time. Um, wait, no, we're over here. Sorry. Uh, but now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and be beggarly and beggarly are elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. These are all Jewish requirements. And I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. You know that the cause of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And that for which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, though you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labour in birth again under Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now, to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Tell me, you desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other one by a free woman. But he was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are um, um, allergen, allergen, no, allegory? Allegory, sorry. sorry. And the allegory, for these are the two confidence, the one from the Mount Sinai, which, which gendereth to bondage, which is a agar. <clears throat> for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem God is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Isaiah 54 and 1. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. <clears throat> but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Genesis 21. 10. So then children of the bondwoman, but of the free. 
It's one far step from the liberty by which Christ has made us free. You cannot be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You will attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Interesting, when people use the term fallen from grace, they tend to think that they tend to use it like a guy that goes and runs into sin. But what he's saying is the only place in Scripture where you read falling from grace isn't running into sin in the sense of we would say, you know, like debauchery. It's about stopping, stop trusting Jesus. Because that's really running from grace. You're falling from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through God. Okay. There are going to be two statements that are going to encapsulate the entire book, and we're in our last two chapters. There are two statements, and they're going to both start with this. That in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail anything. In other words, it's not the point. Circumcision, not being circumcised, it's not the point. Here's the first of them. Faith working through love. Can you guys say faith working through love? Faith Faith working working through love. love. What's the first of the two of them? Faith. 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 Working through love. So he goes, this is what really is the point. Faith working through love. You all with me on that? We'll get to the second one in a bit here. Emmanuel, who hinders you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Um, So apparently he doesn't know them personally, because he would say whoever he is, right? Like whoever is causing this trouble, oh, he's going to get it. Well, if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. God, you got that verse. <laughs> you, everyone understands what's being said there. We don't need to develop that at all. <laughs> for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Mm-hmm. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor. So. Leviticus 19.18 But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now say then, walk in this spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted after against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to another. So that, can, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, unclean, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand. Just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control against such things, there is no law. Okay, now stop. I have to do this. I have to compare these. It's time for the evening dog sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> Every Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this, this, this one really put up a fight. All right. Notice in verse 19, is it singular or plural, the thing of the flesh there? It's plural. The works of the flesh. Do you see that? Now, what about verse 22 in comparison? Singular. The fruit. That's singular. Did you get that? Yeah. From this point on, please do not say fruits of the Spirit. But you go, but wait a minute, how can a fruit be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? How does that work? What Paul is making is a statement here, and what happens is we don't, we don't, there's a head-on collision with, wait a minute, 
here's my singular and here's all these things, which one gives, right? I'd like you to consider this. The word works is the word ergam. For instance, the word in in Greek is the word en. How's that? En. En ergon, or in work, is where we get the word energy from. Ergon just means activity, motion, what's happening. Now, he says that the flesh has a lot of motion, and it does a lot of things. Any one of these things or a recipe of them can manifest. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let me say it this way. Let's not pick on Tunde, although it would be lovely to do so for the moment. Let's pick on Eddie. Eddie, it's raining and it's lightning outside, and for whatever reason, Eddie decides to do singing in the rain. Oh. It's a beautiful moment. He is just charming viola here. Viola. <laughs> He's barefoot at the moment. As he's barefoot at the moment, BAM! Lightning comes from the sky, hits his belly, and of course, gets sent into his body. I'm, you know, when I was a kid, I used to say, wouldn't it be cool to be hit by lightning? And all of my friends were like, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Y'all with me so far? Yeah. <laughs> the problem is, I don't know if you've ever met anyone hit by lightning. The problem is not where the electricity enters your body. The problem is where it exits. And it almost always never exits the place it enters. So, in this case, it entered through his hand because he was holding his belly. But let's say it blew a hole in his side. So he's got this, no more bikinis for it, which we're all good with, him too. <laughs> he's got this hole in his side now, a scar for the rest of his life on his side. It isn't where it came in that did the most damage. It's where it came out. And it didn't come out the same place it came in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The works plural of the flesh are the same when you are in the flesh it doesn't matter what feeds your flesh that's just where the that's where it enters it could exit any one of these or a multiplicity of these when a guy goes and he tears apart children with his bare hands and he tells you that he's been addicted to pornography and you say children pornography nope violent pornography nope but pornography Pornography was the brelly, if you will. But it exited in a most violent manner. I can't tell you what your brelly is, but I can tell you this. Brellies are different for different people. There are some people who cannot watch football. I'll be honest. There are other people that can watch football that isn't going to be a big deal. But some people, it turns them into someone that is completely in the flesh. So if someone says, Pastor Tony... Is playing tennis a sin? And I would say, I've never seen you play. <laughs> because for some it is, it could be, and for some it might not be. Because it all depends on what it does to you. Is it your brownie or not? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's the bad news. Because you're like, I don't understand. I don't feel like I'm staring at pornography, but I'm still dealing with lust. Or I don't understand... I'm not like watching Mean Girls, but I'm still dealing with gossip. You know what I mean? It's amazing where you can go with this. It doesn't have to come out the place it comes in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So he gives us a list to say, man, it could fly out in a handful of places here. Mm -hmm. Here's the good news. And this is why it is so important. What does it mean that it's the fruit of the Spirit? What that means is, when you're investing in the Spirit, all of these things are going to manifest. Because they're all part of the one. There's not like, well, it might be. As I'm investing, as right now you are being invest in, spiritually investing God is developing in you more love and more joy and more peace and more long-suffering and more kindness and more goodness and more faithfulness and more gentleness and more self-control because they're all one fruit. Though they may have different facets of that fruit, the bottom line is like the everlasting gobstopper. It has different flavors the more you lick it, but what's going to happen is they all manifest. And you'd say, well, that person seems like they have more patience than I do. Well, maybe that may be a strength God's given them, but when you guys are both spiritually investing, you're both going to grow in all of those areas because it's a single fruit. Does that make sense? That's what makes it so awesome is it goes, hey, these are the works and it can happen in any of these. But when you invest spiritually, the fruit of that is all of these things. Okay, we'll move on. But I just thought you, I love that point. Yeah. 24. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
those who are Christ are crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoked from one another, envying one another. Finally, our last chapter. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are a spiritual you are a spiritual restore such a one in spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted see the services he's developing here bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ oh sorry. <laughs> or if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing he deceiveth himself but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in for each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap the flesh of corruption. Oh, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in the season we will reap, if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are at the house of faith. Wait a minute, is God telling you to play favorites? <coughs> he actually is. Look at verse 10. Let us do good, but especially to who? To Christians. But let's face it, you know why? Because we're family. You wouldn't be upset if I treated my children a little bit more special than I did you because they're my family. The world needs to see us treat each other like family. See what large letters I've written to with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that I may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Wow. Today they don't do a lot of that except in one area. Do you know the one event that people do this with? Baptism. There are certain groups that will tell you you're not saved until you're baptized, and then they'll boast about how many people they baptized. Well, anyways. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me. I to the world. And our second of the two statements. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new create creature. Okay, now let me ask you, do you remember what the first one was? Faith through love. Faith working through love. Mm -hmm. Listen, the point is not circumcision or uncircumcision. Here's the point. Two things. Faith working through love and a new creation. So let me say it in the simplest sense. What really matters, who you are and what you do, who you are, you're a new creation now. What you do, exercise your faith by loving each other. If you do those things, everything else is going to fall in the line. Mm -hmm. Okay, last, few, last three verses. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with the Spirit. It's an awesome book. It's like, it's so deburdening. Getting the weight off your shoulders. And saying, man, what if it was all just about this? To be a new creation, stop dragging the old you over. And love each other. Exercise your trust in God by loving each other. Watch what happens there. That's pretty darn simple. All right, well, let's pray.